I'm here with Punishment Martinez, who has really become a fixture in Ring of Honor at this point. He's got a huge match at the upcoming ROH 16th anniversary show. We have a live post-show podcast right after that. Punishment Martinez, how you doing? Doing good, man. What's going on? Uh, like, you've got this big match, and I mean, this is really big in, in the grand scope of things against Marty Skrull. Uh, how are you looking at this match? This is a guy who has, like, his visibility at this point is uh, pretty extreme due to being the elite and, and all that. Uh, what are, What's your mindset going into a match like this? Uh, shock and awe, you know, that that's what I'm looking forward to. You know, he's already at a certain level of stardom that, a lot of guys want to reach and achieve. So for someone like me to be on live on pay-per-view in a high profile, no one contenders match against this guy, I have to leave an impression that I know will last, you know, for that I could ride on and use this to continue elevating my name. So I, I take this match, you know, as a, more than just being a number one contenders match. This is a match that can elevate me to a whole new uh, level. And uh, they have ROH 16th anniversary, obviously, but Ring of Honor announced the the launch of their streaming service, which, in my estimation, changes the game for Ring of Honor. It makes their their shows uh, more affordable, more more visible. What are you looking for out of this streaming service? Just more eyes on the product. You know, all I hear in different towns that we travel to is, oh, you know, my cable service doesn't carry the channel or this and that. Well, now you get to watch us live on a regular basis. You know, at least once a month, basically, you're probably going to get to watch a live streamed event if you're a part of this on the club streaming service. So I I'm excited for it as, as well as everybody else in the roster because, like I said, we get, you know, right now we have a lot of eyes on our product and it keeps growing and growing and growing. This is going to elevate Ring of Honor to a whole new uh, uh, level of uh, mainstream, you know, pro wrestling, especially here in the United States, where, like I said, a lot of fans can't really reach our product. They can't see it live or they can't, um, you know, watch, let's say, on a weekly basis our television uh, product. But now they can watch back our TV segments. They could watch back um, all the, you know, live events. And they get discounts on pay-per-views and merch and whatnot. So this is like a gift, basically, for wrestling fans all alike. I can tell that Sinclair Broadcast has the best interest in Ring of Honor at heart because, you know, ultimately they are a broadcast company, and what what their primary goal you would assume is is get TV ratings, get viewership, things like that. But for a long time, they've allowed Ring of Honor to run their shows on the website as well, and are doing so with with Honor Club too. So you can tell that like they're not greedy in that respect. They understand there are some markets that don't have. ROH TV and they're doing their best to get it out there. Uh, I think this is just a big step and you've, you've had some big steps over the past year or so since joining Ring of Honor. Now you're far from new to the wrestling game, but has uh, being with Ring of Honor, has that helped you help raise your profile? Have you noticed that in any certain way? Oh, absolutely. In every way, shape or form. I mean, I've, I've become a better performer as well, you know? Um, I, I, people that don't know me and don't know my background, you know, to them, I'm a new pro wrestler, you know, I just started, but which is not the case, but in the short time that I've been in ring of honor, I feel like I've improved and learned so much because it's a different style, you know, being on television and, you know, a different fan base and you, you're working with basically the best wrestlers in the world because between here, new Japan, CMLL, the UK, you know, and all the partnerships that Ring of Honor has, we have so much talent that we work with that, I mean, you have no choice but to get better or else get out. So it's really, really um, changed my whole, uh, my whole style, basically, and, and the way I work and the way you perceive me and see me. And so, I, yeah, I definitely see a big change in not only that, but, of course, my name value. You know, I, I, am, I like to think that I'm somebody who's, a name in professional wrestling that people know, or at least heard, have heard of, which is kind of cool. Now, I know you weren't on the, the latest Honor Rising shows, but you've been a part of a few uh, joint New Japan Ring of Honor shows. Do you ever change your style up for that, uh, or does that does that uh, change anything at all? I I think I adapt to each individual style. So depending who I'm working with, you know, uh, uh, who I'm in the ring with, I, I have to adapt to 
you know, different styles. And that's why I'm very proud as a big man in, in pro wrestling that I'm able to do a little bit of everything. I'm not just a brawler. You know, I can mat wrestle. I can submission wrestle. I can fly if I have to. So I like that I'm able to do a little bit of everything. And I purposely worked on those things to be able to perform on a level with all these great stars from all over. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily change my style. I adapt to their style, put it that way. I'm particularly interested in how, like, maybe you got in touch with Ring of Honor. I know you did a lot of stuff at Monster Factory, and uh, there are some ROH connections there. But how did uh, contract negotiations, per se, go down with Ring of Honor? Because, I mean, you're you're a different looking guy in pro wrestling. You're not. You, there's not a lot of six and a half foot tall guys. Just they don't grow on trees. So, I mean, uh, obviously, you, you've got a, a unique wrestling style for that size, and I'm. I'm interested in you as a commodity. How did you approach negotiations with Ring of Honor or vice versa? Uh, I mean, it's all timing, right place, right time. You know, I, I like we talked about, I've been wrestling for a long time. Mm -hmm. and But I wasted a lot of that time. The first 10 years of me being in this business was a, a complete waste. And I tell people all the time, don't be me. Don't be the guy that wasted his time and thought he could coast on his size. Because that's exactly what I did. And it did not work for me, <laughs> and deservedly so. I was out of shape, so it, it took me starting to do Ring of Honor tryout camps, getting in front of them, started training at the dojo while I was still at the Monster Factory just to get better. And like I said, I got in shape. I lost over 100 pounds. And, you know, Delirious, who's the head trainer and booker of Ring of Honor, he saw these things. Um, and, and I was persistent. That was the main key, too. I was so persistent. I wouldn't stop. I wouldn't stop. And I... I did multiple tryouts where they liked me as a worker, but everything else, the full package wasn't complete. And finally, it was actually at a trial camp where I showed up to do another trial camp. When I, as soon as I walked through the door, I was pulled into the office and they told me that they wanted to offer me a job. And this is after I did the top prospect tournament. They wanted to offer me a, a contract. And, you know, and that was, that was that. I mean, they, they, Kevin Kelly at the time uh, was involved with, the negotiation he was the one that called and 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 did everything contractual uh lee uh, you know pertaining to the contract he's the one that called me and explained everything and and you know ran through everything and, and set everything up but basically it was just me being persistent and just showing up and uh you know i'm then taking notice and realizing that this wasn't i wasn't just there to show face i really wanted this and i was doing everything possible even for somebody who's been in the business a while i was willing to, you know, uh, humble myself into these positions where I already had done the top prospect tournament, but yet I was still showing off the tryout camps. You know, nobody does that. You know, only a handful of people have, and that's why those people are successful. And I just followed that mold and, you know, did what I had to do to finally gain an opportunity. At what point would you say was the turning point and you were like, okay, I got to take this more serious? You know, I was uh... – running strip clubs in Atlantic city <laughs> and I was living a pretty decent life. It'll I was going to say that, that already sounds like, like well, what turning point? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, but this is what had happened. Uh, I, I was living, you know, in a penthouse apartment on the boardwalk, make good money, running a club. Uh, I was, you know, I was having a good time and, but I was still wrestling on the weekends and training and whatever. So, you know, I had to miss time from the club and, the owners basically gave me an ultimatum, which was, hey, stop doing that wrestling thing and just we want you here, you know, every day. And for, for whatever reason, and I, I've been given advice and been critiqued and been, been told everything by everybody. But for, for some reason, that day, those words clicked on something. And without hesitation, I said, ah, uh, nah, man, you have my two weeks notice. <laughs> this is not what I want to do. And then, but by doing that, I was like, well, if I'm giving my two weeks notice on this job, I really have to do everything possible or else what's the point point? and like I said I don't know what why that day I felt that way but man I really really put my 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 foot to that you know that pedal and didn't look back and I know you've done a lot of stuff at, at Monster Factory and I know Danny Cage my god all he posts is motivational stuff so <laughs> like I yeah. see that and I'm like I, I'm like you know I, I can't be surprised you came from the Monster Factory yeah, I started in. I started training in 2003. I didn't have my first match till sometime in 2004. 
Um, and at the time, it was owned by Larry Sharp, and they had different uh, trainers there. And Danny took it over in 2011 and asked me to come on board with him, you know, just to help out and, you know, have his back if need be, and vice versa. Vice versa, he, you know, has motivated me as well. So we have a good relationship, and I still to this day go down to the Monster Factory and help out however I can, and whatever knowledge that is instilled into me, as even to this day, everything I learn, you know, after every match, I could learn something after talking to guys, and especially now that we got guys like Bully and, you know, Lethal and all these guys that they, they'll take the time out to say, hey, good match, but this and this and this, you know, and I learn every time I have a match, and then I take those things I learn, and I try to pass them on to the younger students so that they don't have as hard of a road that I did, you know. I, I try to explain to them, hey, these are the mistakes that I made. These are the mistakes I'm still making. Don't make the same ones. You'll be better than me. You know, and I just try to help out that way.